Welcome back to the Flying Moose. I have procured yet another A220 for the purposes of making a YouTube video. I'm actually gonna sign an A220 for the sole purpose of making this video. This is part two of my deep dive into the C-Series full story. Today we'll be covering the future of this beautiful plane, why I think Airbus will use it to replace the A320, and how, <laughs> it was like this. and why they're totally okay with doing that. As is customary on this channel, I'll be splitting this video up into three distinct cabins. In first class, we'll look at the market context. In business, we'll explore how the A220 is a natural replacement for the A320. And finally, in economy, we'll look at the imminent stretch 500 model and see how it plays into all of this. But before we do that, I promised everyone a giveaway of one of these hoodies in my last video. It's been a while, but the winner of that is Michael. Thanks to everyone who participated, and hopefully I'll have more of these soon. With that, let's get started. I'm at Jungfrau Joch, the highest railway station in Europe. And just like this station, the A220 is flying high. We ended off last video looking at the near-term drivers of demand for the A220. If you haven't seen that yet, you should watch it. It's half an hour long, and I'll make sure that this video is not half an hour long. The long-term upside of these drivers, however, is more apparent, and it sets us up nicely to see how the A220 could easily surpass the A320 in the future. It's really bright and I can barely see. You know how sometimes you can use the wrong formula and still get the right answer? Well, somehow, Bombardier's original estimate for 6,000 planes back in 2004 still holds. Maybe that's because the original estimate was ambitious at best, but the industry has embraced point-to-point -point travel that benefits the A220 on a level that few would have imagined possible. Updated forecasts from Embraer and Airbus size the market at at least 6,000 aircraft. Now keep in mind, these are definitely biased because these two companies make planes in this segment. But even more conservative estimates have it at at least 4,000 aircraft over the next 20 years. And one wild card is the Asia-Pacific region, where the A220's capabilities can open up new and exciting routes, for example, between Kuala Lumpur and Seoul, or even Sydney. With the pandemic still causing uncertainty, the A220's small size, flexibility, and favorable unit economics reduces operational risk for airlines. In a self-fulfilling cycle, what may start out as right-sizing existing routes, such as the transcontinental between Montreal and San Francisco, may spur the creation of routes that are only profitably served by the A220, something that bodes well for demand for the aircraft. There could easily be demand for over 2,000 aircraft over the next 20 years to replace aging A320s, 737s, and E190s. Carriers with dominant A319 CEO fleets like Brussels Airlines are prime candidates to bite on replacements to the A220. This is especially true for Brussels, who rank 90 out of 128 airlines in terms of A319 fleet age. A longer timescale also gives airlines with established A320 fleets like American and United more time to transition over to the A220. In a decade or more, the increased fuel efficiency and flexibility of the A220 might make it too attractive to ignore as a replacement option. For United specifically, the Denver hub looks like a prime candidate to host the A320. A220. 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 Environmental sustainability is a topic that I feel strongly about, especially as a young person, and as we're surrounded by all this beautiful nature. Airlines are finally pushing to become greener, thanks to a combination of government, business, and customer pressures. And the A220 is one of the most fuel efficient aircraft out there. This is especially true if the A220 here is helping to right size routes currently overserved by wide body planes like these or it replaces older, less fuel efficient regional jets. And no, that is not a regional jet. I don't know why it's in this exhibit. Airlines like Air Canada can optimize their network to serve non-hubs in the spirit of fuel efficiency. For example, Air Canada currently flies a 777 from Toronto to Zurich, with passengers connecting onto destinations like Gothenburg. The 777 pumps out over 130 grams of CO2 per seat mile, while the A220 emits less than 90. Replacing these Toronto to Zurich to other destination routes with direct A220 operations could result in near instant CO2 savings, provided the smaller A220s could actually be filled. Conversely, Air Canada could elect to replace the transatlantic Toronto to Zurich route with two A220s, one still from Toronto to Zurich, but the other going to a place like Oslo, maintaining connectivity with an airline like SAS while still seeing emission savings. 
This is just an example, but the A220's unique capabilities mean that airlines will have another lever with which they can use to optimize their carbon emissions, making it just that much more valuable. The A220 already has clear strengths in this future environment. Will the market shape out like this for sure? Nobody knows, but this section was based on research and consensus. So if I'm wrong, I'm definitely not trying to be. We've seen how the external environment might favor the A220, but why this specific aircraft to replace the good old A320 family? Well, it's actually not that difficult. It's not that hard, Scott. Tell them, watch. It's incredibly hard. They're operationally alike, or at least close enough, and preemptively replacing the A320 with the A220 could go a long way towards helping Airbus dominate the long and thin market against Boeing. The linchpin of this argument that we'll get to in a second. The A220 has been touted as a crossover between regional and narrow-body jets, but this means that it's not as obvious a replacement for either one. The A220 isn't a one-to-one -one replacement for the larger 320 from a strict capacity standpoint, but the story is different when you consider their now converging mission sets. Airlines had previously been upgaging single aisle routes to achieve lower per seat costs, because each additional passenger past a certain point doesn't increase your total cost proportionally, and this is true across stretch versions of aircraft as you can see in the cost per ASM for the A319, 20, and 21 for certain US airlines. You can think about it like this. When you're flying 150 passengers, a lot of the weight of the aircraft is fixed. Squeezing in an extra 5 passengers doesn't increase that weight proportionally, resulting in lower per seat costs. However, the A220 already operates at these lower per seat costs without needing the extra capacity. Martin Gauss, the CEO of Air Baltic, has said that the 220 is the best choice for 320 operators that don't need high capacities, noting that the 300 model fits naturally at the lower end of the narrow body category. Richard Noble, a director at Skytech, goes even further, saying that the 300 might as well be a mainstream narrow body. A stretched 500 version of the A220 is likely needed before the aircraft can credibly replace A320s, or even 321s, but the situation is far from being one where the 220 is absolutely allergic to the missions currently flown by these larger narrow bodies. It's worth touching on the non-Airbus competition here, mainly Embraer's E2 jets, because they're arguably less well suited to replace the A320's CEO. Both the 190 and 195 E2 have better economics than the older regional jets, which let's face it, isn't that difficult, but they lack the range to truly rival the A320. We've talked about physical dimensions and costs, but no discussion about fleet replacements is complete without going inside the aircraft. I'm talking about how easy it'll be for pilots to fly these things, or flight commonality. So how much flight commonality is there between the A220 and other Airbus models like the A320? Well, as a student, I don't do extra work if I don't have to. It's a good thing there's a Quora answer for this exact question. In all seriousness, our friend Trent isn't wrong. The A220 never was a true Airbus product, and apparently shares more with the 787 than the A320. The lack of commonality isn't necessarily a good or bad thing, but just something to note. While carriers with robust A320 fleets like American likely won't be enticed to switch the A220 in the near term, it's almost a built-in backstop against excessive cannibalization of the A320, pushing demand off until Airbus can ramp up production of the A220. I think that this is the meat of why Airbus is more than okay with usurping the A320 with the A220, because coming out on aggregate ahead of Boeing is what truly matters. I'll first lay out Airbus and Boeing's offerings in relation to each other, then make the argument that A320 cannibalization actually makes sense when considering the entire product landscape. Airbus is banking that the world is moving to the right half of the diagram, i.e. where fuel efficiency is highly valued. This seems reasonable given the state of eco-initiatives across the industry, such as bans on short flights in France to the A380 hydrogen testbed. Taking a look at Boeing's products in this high fuel efficiency world, they can only counter with the Max 7 and 10, two aircraft that don't achieve quite the same efficiencies as the 220 and 321neo respectively. Side by side, we can see that Airbus products are more attractive with the A220 than without, whether it be from a range, fuel efficiency, or capacity standpoint, for the most part. This brings us to our next point, why potential cannibalization is okay either way. In short, even if Airbus cannibalizes the A320 family, they'll gain a stronger hold on the market as a whole, as their entire product line will outperform Boeing's in an efficiency-focused world. I'll repeat that. It's okay if the A320 suffers, because Airbus will come out on top. 
Let's not forget that Airbus has pulled off this type of preemptive cannibalization before, on the C-Series itself no less. Back in 2014, when the C-Series was starting to look more and more threatening, Airbus launched the NEO program to take on Bombardier. They did this even though such a move risked cannibalizing their A320 CEO line. Self-disruption isn't something that they shy away from, and they likely view the opportunity to stay abreast of Boeing with the A220 as well worth any supposed threat of cannibalizing the 320. There's also a sense that they have their bases covered with how large the world's current 320 fleet is and the aforementioned lack of fleet commonality. Airlines will still order the 320 in the near term, so any transition to the 220 will likely be a gradual process, not a cliff. This honestly might be a stretch, but it's a fun one. We know that Airbus is deliberate with their naming. I mean, they skipped a couple of models when they released the A380. The most common theories are that an 8 looks like a double-decker or that Airbus is trying to break into the Chinese market, but either way, this might mean that the name A220 has a little more meaning to it. They could have easily called it the A200 and still gotten that separation from the other Airbus products, but calling it 220 might signify an intention to replace the 320. Finally, we have to talk about the A220-500, the rumored stretch version that pretty much exists but doesn't yet. If you still have doubts on whether it's coming, Airbus' own COO has made it clear. And the original C-Series designs included a feasible stretch version, not some triple-decker stretch concept like the ones we saw for the 747. The 500 is especially important in the context of replacing the A320 family, because it'll provide a more than viable alternative to the A320 and potentially even the A321. This rounds out the 220 family's offerings for a 110-seater, 140-seater, and 170-seater, mapping very loosely to the 319, 320, and 321 models, albeit at slightly lower capacities. Airlines will naturally have different levels of need for the A220. For those with robust 320 or 321 fleets, that replacement won't come that soon. But the 320 is an old aircraft. In Delta's case, the average age of their 320s is 26 years. That's two years older than the average age of their 767s, one of which is in a museum behind me. With 320 fleet replacements due up over the coming decade, and the 500 looming as quite possibly the best in-class replacement, there's an opening that the A220 can fill. In Delta's case, however, they recently ordered the 737 MAX, probably because they can't wait for the 500 to come, and Boeing probably gave them a sweet deal. A caveat here that it's too early to tell what the true long-term effects of the pandemic will be, but there may be some trends that bode well for the 500 and wider 220 family. The first is potentially depressed air travel demand, creating an environment where airlines can use the 500 to downgauge key wide-body routes while maintaining the frequency critical for attracting high-value business travel. It's generally better for scheduling to run three flights a day than one, even if the total number of seats remains the same. The second change concerns flying habits, where passengers may be more reluctant to transit through major hubs. Replacing routes currently undertaken by multiple regional jets with a single journey could prove a much more attractive proposition for high-value passengers. Many Western countries now seem to be emerging from the worst of COVID, and air travel in 2022 is forecast to reach over 85% of pre-COVID levels in North America. But as we've seen with Omicron, the pandemic can turn south at any point, taking air travel with it. Replacing the A320 will be no easy task. It's been a true global workhorse for over 35 years, and is basically tied with the 737 for the most popular commercial jet of all time. The A220 is undoubtedly a capable aircraft that makes Airbus better, and it only helps that the industry is creating the right environment for the jet to thrive. Only time will tell if it's truly the A320 successor, but either way, it's poised to dominate air travel for years to come.